All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Tuesday TEDx interview. I have been doing this for over 16 years, where every Tuesday, 9 o'clock Pacific, I'm interviewing a badass mortgage professional. 70% of the time and 30%, it's authors, leaders, and people that I think can help mortgage professionals get to the next level. Now, I am interviewing more realtors than ever on this TEDx Tuesday, and I've I've got, uh, I just confirmed Mike Ferry a couple days before, or Tom Ferry, excuse me, Tom, Tom Ferry, a couple days before, I think it's on the 14th or the 15th, so stay tuned on that. And then we're going to be doing Script of Palooza um, on the 20th, just after the NAR settlement comes out. So we're going to have Mike Ferry, a few, Tom Ferry, a few days before. And then we're going to have Phil, Phil Jones and the whole Script of Palooza gang right after. So lots of big things happening. So today we have Sean Herrero, who I've interviewed more times than I can count. Um, in my opinion, he is absolutely one of America's best mortgage professionals. Uh, not only does he do an incredible amount of volume, but the the level of advice that he delivers, the the modern tactics, the personal brand that he's built, it's it's really special. How are you doing, brother? I'm doing good, brother. Thank you for having me, dude. I'm excited for this one. Yeah, I know you are. Yeah, you picked the topic. Um, before we get to the topic, just let me know how how are you doing in the market right now? I mean, we are now one day away from August. The year is over, way over, and we're a couple weeks away from the NAR settlement coming into place. So how's production? How's business? Yeah, um, I think I'm at 55 million as of today. Um, tracking for my my goals 100. Um, so I think I'll break that. Um, I love the NAR settlement. Things been super excited. Been waiting for it to get here. And of course, now that we're 17 days out, realtors are actually paying attention. So um, no, I'm stoked. It's, everything's been good. I mean, it, this is the best opportunity for a mortgage advisor. It's the worst opportunity for a loan officer. Yeah, amen to that. So you said you're you're, you're going to hit 100 million this year. Yeah, uh, and uh, and then how is just pre -quals? You know, are they coming in in volume? Like, what's the rhythm of opportunities? So I'd say that uh, feels like the last two weeks we've had a little bit of a lull as far as people getting pre-approved. Even the market, I've seen a little bit of a shift uh, with more price reductions and just things sitting longer, but everyone's saying, you know, you get the two week lull in the beginning of the summer and then there's the two week lull right before school goes back. And that's what the explanation is. But I've been focusing a lot on uh, refinance uh, for VA and FHA streamlines through my pipeline as well. So I think I got four of those this morning. Yeah, and by the way, that's so far, we put a poll in our Facebook group, figure out what are the six critical conversations at Script Palooza. And so far, how to get a meeting with a realtor is winning as that's what people want the most. Um, database calls is like number three. And then number two, it sounds like, you know, cross between your unique value prop for realtors and how to create urgency in the purchase business uh, and 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 how to actually have the pre-qual conversation with NAR coming in. So Sean, I did a, um, yesterday, every, every Monday, I do a Hey Producing Managers on LinkedIn. I do a video, I do a post where I am, giving my advice to producing managers. And this, this week I, I focused on like, guys, we're, we're just a couple weeks away from the NAR settlement hitting. And I, from what I'm hearing in the market that most buyers aren't going to know uh, whether the, the, the seller of the home is going to pay for the buyer's commission. And they're not going to know the details on that. So they're going to be going in blind. And, and so I think that's going to be really important for the loan officer to be able to show options like, Hey, if they don't pay, here's a couple options. If they do pay, this is what it looks like, but really help get the consumer clear on what their cash to close is going to be. And regardless of how the seller participates and pays for the buyer agent commission, uh, they're clear and they're confident. Any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I met with two agents last week. I've been meeting with all my agents. We're creating collaborative uh, buyer presentations. So I have, the finance side is what I call the foundation of their presentation. Uh, it's my job to show buyers how they're not only going to save money, but make money uh, through their home purchase by using the realtors that I partner with. So I have the foundation built for that. And then we have a collaborative presentation saved in Canva that they can update, I can update. Um, but we were talking about this and I'm in California uh, and the California contract, uh, as of what I saw last week, uh, and today's July 30th, 
um, it did not allow the seller in any way to um, pay compensation, um, which I think is a good thing because it gets rid of that greenness of who is offering, who isn't offering, all of that nonsense. It's just, hey, uh, seller, we want to build it into the price, so we're going to offer more or we're going to ask for a credit. It's it's really no different than what we've done. We're just adding a, a layer of transparency, which I, of course, love. So the agents I'm working with are like, Sean, this is epic, like what you're creating and how you're explaining it because it makes their job easier. But um, yeah, on my end, I'm seeing, man, I wish I had an example of a contract. Um, I'll get it from them, Dave, and I'll send it to you. But um, the, there's, the seller cannot pay compensation uh, or, or, or advertise or offer. It needs to be negotiated on the buy side. Yeah, I'm going to put a poll in a minute. So when I publish this poll, everybody answer it. But I would love to just in comments right now, give us a feel for what percentage of your buyers are going to know if the seller is participating and how much they're willing to participate and what percent is going to be blind. I want to know, here we are, three weeks. What does the lending industry think? Like, what do you think? And then it's going to be interesting to see how does this play out? So please um, put put your guesstimates in, in here. And then, Sean, you know, I interviewed you several weeks ago. And if you could, you know, we'll push people to that interview. But if you could um, just tell everybody what you're doing and how you're educating realtors right now. And I'll share a link to that last interview we did. Yeah. So for me, um, everything I do is problem solving, right? So uh, that's why I think this is a massive opportunity for uh, mortgage advisors, because we have an opportunity to solve problems for real estate partners and create new real estate partners because they haven't met us yet. So this has been like the best thing to happen to the mortgage industry, in my opinion. Um, if you like to give advice, if you don't, and you want to be a good faith estimate loan officer, good luck. Um, so for me, um, I'm meeting with all of my agents. I'm showing them how we would, basically nothing's changed. Think of it this way. Uh, let's just use 5%. If the seller was going to pay 5% in commissions to the buyer's agent or total of 5%, the seller doesn't care what the sales price is. They care what they're going to net. So if now it's going to be two and a half, they're just looking at their net. So we're just going to adjust the price according. So the price has already been adjusted a little bit. And then we just have to be very strategic in our offer. Uh, when we're showing how to finance these options. And you, if you guys are like, oh, I want to see the mortgage coach for that. Um, Dave and I have talked about this. Like, I think this might be the fourth time we've talked about this together, maybe the third. Um, it's it's all there. And, and that mortgage coach tool is what I'm using to make sure that everyone knows exactly what it looks like. Uh, it's part of my pre-approval process now is getting the buyer broker agreement from my buyer because I have to know, do they have enough reserves? If they have to pay out of pocket, will they pay out of pocket? Do we negotiate it into the sales price? Do we get a credit? There's all these different ways to approach it. Um, and we're just making sure we get all that up front to make sure they make the most confident decisions. What? So hang on, Nara. So I think it is game time right now. And I am getting ready to save this as a poll. And I am now pushing it out to everyone. Launch. So here, here is the poll. And Sean, in a minute, I'm going to ask you how you would answer it. I just wrote this up while I was talking. So I, I am mm -hmm. capable of multitasking. Please, guys, the quicker you answer this, the better. Um, do you think it will be less than 10% will be blind? Do you think it's going to be 10 to 30%? Do you think it's going to be like 50-50? Or do you think most buyers will be blind if the seller is paying the buyer's agent. And so far, um, not enough of you have voted. I want to get this to 70%. Like if you're on this call, guys, give us a statistically valid test. I want 70% of you to, 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 to guess. And Sean, what would, how would you have answered this poll? Um, I would say that none of the buyers will be blind uh, when they make an offer. Um, because that's, the number one thing that the buyer's agent will be doing now is when they reach out to build rapport and do what they're supposed to do with the listing agent. Hey, is your seller going to be willing to pay any compensation? Right. And again, in California, it doesn't sound like that's an option. So we're just going to be negotiating it in um, just like we would have uh, in a multiple offer situation. You know, the, the game was what price do we offer to win the house? There's just an additional layer of that. What price do we offer to win the house and build in the commission if the buyer wants to, and is our 
commission higher or lower than what other offer commissions are on this house. So there's just more complexity. And I love complexity because it, it just makes me more valuable. But I think every buyer will know the answer to that question before they make an offer because it's the first thing they're going to want to know and what the seller's going to want to know. Yeah, I'm going to debate that here in a minute here. I'm trying to get back Sweet. to the poll. I'm going to end it, guys. And here, here is the answer. So I just shared it with you guys. This is how the industry answers it. And I'm actually writing a LinkedIn post on this right now. And, and what I'm going to read now is not my opinion. This is James Dwiggins' opinion, who runs a large independent, one of the top 20 independents in the country, uh, has over 6,000 agents. Um, I also heard that that um, um, one of the largest national platforms is going to issue a similar message. But they're saying over the next 20, 12 months, the majority of real estate brokerages will move away from cooperative commission unless we're in a buyer's market where there's a lot of inventory and little buyers. For now, right now, again, I'm just reading what he wrote. There is zero reason for sellers and seller's agents should advise buyers, agents on compensation or concessions, anything in advance of an offer. Um, the only thing an agent should state every, every time and put in the MLS, which is the following, seller is willing to entertain any and all requests put in the offer, the end. So like mm -hmm. that, that's it. So, yep. so they're going to be blind. Like they're not going to know whether the seller is going to pay something, so, anything. That's blind, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think maybe our definition of it's different. Because again, for us, the seller cannot pay compensation to a buyer's agent uh, as through, through the offer, right? So we are building it in to our offer. So if we were going to offer a million dollars on it, I have this thing memorized now. I used a um, million dollars as my example. Um, I would bump the price to a million 27 to build in the two and a half percent commission to net the seller the same as if they were paying the full commission at a million. So, and then if I want to build in their closing costs as well, it's a million 38 to net the seller the same thing. So what we are doing is we basically, part of my uh, offer process is creating net sheets, seller net sheets to show the psychology of the seller for the buyer so they can go into that offer with complete confidence. So maybe I should say my buyers won't be blind because they're signing an agreement. Here's how I look at it. And I work, uh, James Dwiggins' partner is somebody that I do events with out here. So I know it's, he's been the one guiding me through a lot of this. The buyer has to sign an agreement with their agent saying, you are worth X to me, right? It doesn't matter who pays it. They have to go into it, signing that agreement with the possibility they may have to pay that out of their own pocket, which they haven't in the past. They've always could, but they haven't. I will be advising them to build it into their price, to have it be just what it's always been. The price, the commission has always been built into the price forever and always. We just didn't see it that way. So it's like this psychology shift that happens. Um, so for me, We'll never be blind because uh, I, I know because you, you see what I'm saying? Okay, right, right. Well, and my point was that they will be blind, like they won't know how it's gonna play out, but they won't be blind because they have Sean Herrero who has told them, Hey, here's here's the different ways in which this could play out. So yeah, I was, you know, misinterpreting your point. And and so here's my question to the group. How are you doing that? How good are you at giving the consumer clarity? and confidence so that not only are they going to be super excited about buying a house right now, they're going to be super excited about writing a winning offer that's going to build, that's going to, you know, have multiple offers. Like how good are you at that? So I did a, a, I'm going to put a link to it. I did a LinkedIn post. Like I said, every Monday I do a post on LinkedIn and it's two producing branch managers and go watch it. I put a link to it. You didn't by any chance see that, that, video I did yesterday. I no, I didn't haven't seen it yet. Okay. Check it out. It's just two minutes. It's on LinkedIn. Uh so so let's transition. Um you picked the topic. Like I wanted yeah. to interview you. I said, hey, like this is all going down. I think your video was the most watched 
loan officer video like weeks after this NAR settlement came out. Um, I'll show everybody how to get to that later. But but like you picked this topic. Why'd you pick this topic yeah. right now? Life balance. Like why why do you want to talk about this? Um, because I think we're all going through it, and uh, I kind of had this stress and anxiety moment, and I'll get to that one sec. Um, that made me want to talk about this. I did a little call on it personally last week. Um, but one thing on the on the NAR stuff. Um, Anne had a question real quick before we move on. She said, if the commission can't be built into the offer, and then it's built into the price of the home, how does the seller pay the commission? The seller in 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 California, at least for me so far, cannot offer. They can't say if they will, but we can negotiate in to say price to be. A million twenty-seven uh, credit uh, seller to pay commission. So they built that line item into our new contract, so they can pay it, but they can't advertise that they can pay it or say they're going to pay. It. Um, hey, hey, real I quick before you go, because I want to don't one want to spend too much time on this, but Ann, mm -hmm. I'll put a link to this. But if you just go to trustengine.com forward slash ten x, number one, it defaults to NAR settlement strategies. So, so one. This I did a whole interview with Sean and he covers it in detail. I did a whole interview with Jeremy on this. He covers it. Whole interview with Daniel Saw. And then if you go down here, I have this 10X playlist, but I've got this new playlist and it's called 10X Sales Trading Clips. So literally you can go see these value props. If you scroll down, you can see and actually watch like right here. You want to see how Jeremy does it? Watch this. I've got one how Sean does it. So so just know that there's a lot of content. Go watch that. And by the way, anyone else watching this, I just want to make sure that we we focus much of this around the, the headline. But anything else you want to say, yeah. Sean, before we focus around the we, headline? I mean, yeah. So I have an event uh, August 23rd. I call it Tiny Event. It's down in Newport Beach. I'm literally handing out exactly what I do. So I can't explain it in an hour, but I can explain that process in detail, how I'm building the presentations, how I'm solving these problems, how I'm building the price. We go through all of that at that event. Um, well, real, so real getting... quick, guys. And I, I have, I facilitate, Sean does that event. It's a two-day workshop. It, it, it is one of the, like the content we're creating right now, you're getting ideas, but you can't, it's not life transformational. You go spend two days with Sean. One, you will know everything he does and how he does it. And the two, um, I think I'll probably be leading a sunrise um, walk on the beach. And and that's part of the whole thing. So make sure you guys check that out. We'll put a link to that down below. Anyways. Yeah, Dave, Dave, Dave's beach walk that. is my favorite. Dave's beach walk is my favorite part. Um, and I think, so what we're going to talk about right now is a little bit of more of what goes into that because it's not just business. We get so sucked into tactic, 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 and we lose track of like life. I think every, all of us got into this business because it provides a level of income and a level of freedom. And then we let go of the freedom because we think we have to, I just have to work. I just have to work. Or at least that's how I feel. Right. So, so what made me uh, want to talk about this more is my son rides bulls in California, which is, and I live in the suburbs. I don't live on a ranch or anything. Um, but he was third in the state his first year. I had to be gone for a week at the, the state high school finals. Um, and I was stressed about that. Like I'm going to miss. So the negative voice in our, in my head is saying, you're going to miss opportunities. Your realtors are going to use someone else. Uh, you're going to lose business. You're, you should be working. You should be working. You should be working. And, um, there's a guy named Joel Turner that I took an archery class from. He says, thoughts are not thinking and our thoughts just happen. And then we have the opportunity to think about those thoughts and then shift them. Um, and that applies in archery and applies in, in life. Um, so I really, really try to listen to the thoughts that come into my head and then shift them to be what I actually want them to be and look at these times as opportunities. So, you know, I'm a big fan of Parkinson's law, which says work fills the time you give it. Um, and I will give my work all day when I'm in those, I'll call it scarcity mindset moments. And it's like, it'll take me all day to look at email if I have all day to look at email. But if I don't have all day because I've set up these things that are important, um, everything gets done every single time. I had a day where I had to go do and help a client uh, with an appraisal. He was out of town. I had to go up to, you know, drive two hours north to the mountains. Totally unexpected. That means four hours in the car that day that I did not plan for. I didn't miss a beat. Everything got done. And so I take those moments to remind myself that like we 
we can balance our work and our life, right? Um, we, we deprioritize ourselves and we deprioritize our family for money. And the reality is if we prioritize ourselves and our family first, the money would actually come faster. And, and that's what I've really been learning and paying attention to. Now I noticed, I noticed you didn't call this work life balance. You called it work life blend. blend. And then I love the, the, it, it, this was all Sean's headline, close more loans and have more fun doing it. So what was the, I know you had some nuance. Yeah. You called it blend, not balance. Yeah. So, so when I, so Mr. You know, I missed quote unquote, missed a week of work to be present with my son uh, for the state finals. And then he got third in the state. So we go to Wyoming for nationals and we had to drive there and I had to be there Sunday. It was basically there for eight days. If he had like, if, if we went to the whole thing and I, we have this stress and anxiety of I'm going to lose, I'm going to miss, I'm going to, you know, they're, my, my partners are going to find someone else. All these like negative thoughts that I think a lot of us have business just happened. Like it became like, I call it flow state. Um, I was getting deals and I don't know where they're coming from. Like people, Hey, Sean, I haven't talked to you in a year. I'm going to make an offer, offer accepted. It was just mad. Like it feels magical, but I think it's because we, when we put our, and I don't know if it's, well, I'm not, I keep saying I get fearful of like how I talk about things. So I always want to say, I don't know if it's the law of attraction, you guys, it's not the theory of attraction. It's a law. Like it's proven. Right. So the law of attraction says when you start living the way that you want to live and you take action in the direction you want to move, things will happen. And that's what I found when I was in Wyoming is I was super present with my son. Um, you know, he's running around with his buddies the whole time anyway. So I had tons of time to work. I have Starlink in my van so I can work from anywhere. And and uh, and it was, yeah, like someone just wrote, it was magical. Like it, it, it feels magical. And then we question that of, oh, this can't be realistic. This is going to end, right? Those are the negative voice comes back in and then we create, we, we will always prove ourselves right. So if we say this is unrealistic, this shouldn't be happening like this, it'll stop. So I have really, really been focused since Wyoming on really focusing on what do I need to do? What matters? Um, and then making myself and my family a priority again, because I, I will be the one to say I, I did deprioritize those things, stopped working out, um, everything, right? I was stressed about coming to Hawaii. I'm going to miss, I'm going to miss, I'm going to miss. And I'm like, dude, I'm having a great time. I've used Parkinson's law to get stuff done. So when I'm here, so this is why I say work-life blend. Um, everyone's looking for work-life balance. There's no such thing. There's, there isn't. And you could ask anyone, you'll never find someone who's like, I have this perfectly balanced. Because if you're trying to build something and you're in an entrepreneurial world like we are, there's no two week vacation and I wouldn't want that. Um, but I like having a couple hours. It's like yesterday I'm in Maui. There's a beach I like to take photos at. Um, I drove an hour to that. So I get up at 3 a.m. Because that's 6 a.m. at home. I can get all my detailed work done before people at home wake up, right? Pre-approvals, things like that. Um, kind of set my tone for the day. Then I drove to the beach, got a sunrise swim in, um, took some photos, had a great time in the water, came back, got some work done. Then I went to the pool and hung out with my family. And then at 2 p.m. here, it's 5 p.m. at home. And I can kind of start to shut things down a little bit. That's why I say blend is I don't look for I don't look for days off. I look for like hours. You know, I just need a little time. Like Dave, you know, if, if you're not following Dave on Instagram, I think we all are. I mean, he does his adventure walks every day, right? He like makes it a priority to do those things. That is part of work-life blend because that's important to him. So I'm pushing another um, poll. And, and by the way, while I do that, just a little ode to one of the things I incorporated this year. And, and Sean has played the game with me a little bit, but uh, doing something I call winning by 7 a.m. in the morning. And I have found that, and seven's not the right number for everybody. Todd books bad. I think it's like 8.30. He wins by 8.30. Sean has a different time. But like, if you can win that morning, and be clear on what winning is. It's amazing what it does to your stress and your productivity. So I want to get just a feel, and this is anonymous. I really don't know who is answering, you know, like, like this is anonymous. But but how stressed are, out are you? Are you like, hey, all good. I'm in total flow. I'm a bit stressed out. I'm very stressed. Or like, hey, it's 
dysfunctional. I am toxically stressed out right now. Um, and uh, Sean, where where are you at right now? Like, where? How would you have answered this? I'd like today or in this moment. Yeah, uh, zero, zero. All good. So you're in flow. Hundred percent. Yeah, and it, but again, I, I will get stressed, but I'm catching myself in those moments and applying what Joel says of thoughts are not thinking. So it's like, okay. And, and, and let me ask, like, when has stress ever solved anyone's problem? I can't think of one single time. I think what stress will do for you, because stress creates fight, flight, or freeze. Um, I always, so my mentor is a Navy SEAL, and I always compare what their, their job to ours, and they obviously have a stressful job, and so do we. Um, they're, we're not going to die, right? There's no, their, their stress is, is life-threatening. Ours isn't. But when we get stressed, our body doesn't know it's not life threatening. So we get into fight, flight, or freeze. And, you know, when I used to manage mortgage advisors, I've seen agents literally just vanish and freeze in that moment of stress. Stress creates an opportunity for you to create solutions. Why do I feel like this? How do I not feel like this? And then you move forward. Yeah, here's, here's the audience, by the way, Sean. This is how everybody answered it. So we got 10% all good in a flow state, uh, 55%, the biggest percentage, a bit stressed out, 27% uh, very stressed. Um, so like really 35% are very stressed and, you know, 8%, 10% are just, you know, not in a good space. Any, any advice you have, you know, just for, as a coach, I mean, you are now a coach, a leader, you're putting on an incredible multi-day event. Um, so I want you to almost think like you're talking to your um, tiny event crew and they're in like very stressed out mode. Any, any advice you have for those folks? Yeah, th that's how I look at it. It is um, you focus on what you can control and you let go of what you can't. So in that moment of stress, you have to stop, breathe, take three deep breaths. Like I'm going free Box diving breathe. after this. Box breathe, everybody. Box breathing. Yep. So um, four second in, hold, four seconds out, hold. Do that three times. You can do it once, but do that three times and, and you'll slow your heart rate down. You'll feel better. Um, and it gets you present. You have to count four seconds, four times, and you're, you can't think about multiple things at once. Right. Um, so just let's take it, take a breath. Um, and then, okay, what is the problem? What is stressing you out? Okay. So how do you solve that problem? How do you move forward through it? There's always solutions in that moment you just have to find it um i oh mean i had a good example of one okay oh, here's here's a loan i screwed up story that was stressful so a uh, client gets into contract non-contingent we fully under it and everything um we have to update some documents and we we're basically doing an offset of a mortgage to show someone else was making the payment um well one month they didn't do it and, and it but now i can't use that income to qualify my debt to income ratio is too high he's putting 20 percent down He's non-contingent. I'm stressed out of my mind now. Like, what do I do about this? Okay, Sean, there's a solution here. There either is or there isn't, right? Either, hey, uh, you don't qualify and you can't buy this house anymore, or you can, and here's the new solution. Those are the two options. There's no other way about it. So why should I be stressed out, right? So I went through it. And what I ended up doing is looking for something in 22 years I've never looked for, took a 20% down buyer, moved him to FHA, because the guideline FHA solved the problem. Um, now he has mortgage insurance, which everyone's like, that's a dumb idea. He saved $130 a month over conventional. And so what I learned in that moment is now I need to look at every single loan on FHA to see if it's a benefit to the buyer. And I never would have found that concept or idea had I not had that moment of stress on that one specific deal. But instead of freaking out about it, I did what Dave said, did box breathing. I did one round of it, four seconds in, hold for four seconds, four seconds out, hold for four seconds. Um, boom, problem solved, moving on. Like within 20 minutes, that problem, that very scary moment was solved. Love that. I'm going to add one more thing. And I do box breathing a lot. So Google it. If you don't know how to do it, do it. Absolutely do that. I do it all the time. Uh, and also go, go for a walk. And um, yeah. don't let yourself think about things that you don't have control over and and think about all the things that will get you on track that you do have control over when you take that walk. 
and then also try to get a walking meeting in. Again, there's no silver bullets, but give give those things a whirl. And another thing that I, I am actually personally re-going through Tony Robbins' personal power, 30-day program, it's insane. Uh, I did it in my 20s, and it was one of the best personal development experiences I ever went through. And uh, my my son is going through it right now, and I'm going through it with him. So check it out. All right. So, Sean, we got about 30 minutes left. We're halfway yeah. through this. Um, what are some just you, I know you've already shared one key tenet to to this life, not, you know, not balance, but flow that you create or this blend, as you put it. What are some other things that are, you know, cornerstone to the lesson today? Well, I think well, I just want to touch on what Dave just said is in a, yet another example of work-life blend, because like I said, we prioritize our work, right? We always work, 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 or I shouldn't say we, I, and I'm assuming there's other people on the call that do the same thing. So I always make work the priority. And what Dave just said of you get in those moments, go take a walk. That is work-life blend. I'm putting myself in a place where I can step away from work to go make myself feel better, right? Like that's not a selfish thing to do. Um, but that would be a perfect example of work-life blend because you're doing it in that moment. I don't look for days off. I look for hours off. Um, another person I've been listening to a lot is Joe Dispenza. Um, and he basically takes, he, he explains the science, the true, true science behind the law of attraction. And like a lot of what he said has given me, I, I say the freedom that I'm using now in those moments of negative voice, you're going to fail. Uh, you're a loser, everything's going to fall apart and like flipping and turning on that. Um, I think the biggest thing that happens, what I would challenge everyone to do is put yourself in a position to where you don't have all day to do something. Schedule in yourself first, do whatever you want, whatever makes you happy, like make sure you're doing whatever makes you happy. At least I'd say every, weekly, but try and do it daily, right? There's something you love doing that will make you happy. Put those on your calendar first, then put your family in. And now you're going to have a less time for work. Well, you'll find that you will deprioritize the things that don't matter. You know, if you make your uh, task list at the end of the day or the end of the week, whatever you didn't get done, you either don't want to do. So you procrastinated on it or it doesn't move the needle. So you didn't do it. It wasn't important. And it's like, shoot, I don't need to do any of these things. So like, I think another thing we're missing is self-reflection of what matters, right? So Pareto principle says 20% of your actions lead to 80% of your results. Don't do the other 80%. Just do the 20% and go enjoy your life knowing that the action you took that day is gonna push you forward in the right direction. So here's something I want, I, cause I really want this for myself. <laughs> Selfishly, I'm talking to Sean Herrero and there's work and life. So I want like the three things from each and then the promise of the call was close more loans. So that's the work. And then there's, and have fun doing it. If there was a checklist, like I want, to, I want everybody to get a checklist and then I'll kind of decide in our audience, if you, when you hear him unpack this checklist, if you're like, oh, go deeper on this. But if you had a, like on the work side, since we put work first, if there were three, no more than five things that in order to, be kicking ass in this market, and close more loans. That's the promise. What are the three to five things that need to be on the Sean Herrero checklist? So my, the, I only have two. Um, my, well, that's not true. I, have th I guess a few, but basically I went through an exercise to figure out what my 20% was, right? So I got caught up in this make viral videos on Instagram thing that everyone else was trying to do last year, the year before. Um, and I was very envious of people that their videos were getting more views. They had more followers. And I had this like, why am I failing moment, right? Like, how come these guys are doing better? How come people don't like my videos? Um, how come I don't have more followers? And then a few of those people called me and said, man, I haven't closed a loan in two months. And I'm like, oh, well, I've never had that problem. And I'm like, then why are you doing this? Like, why you're doing something that's clearly not working unless you want to be an influencer. If you want to be an influencer, go do your thing, but I hope you're making money outside of doing mortgages. I want to be a mortgage advisor. And I went that, that phone call, the last one of those I had was like, wait, Sean, like you're good at other things. You've done really well, really fast as a mortgage advisor. 
what got you there, right? And I started looking at where my referral partners came from. Um, and it was like, okay, these deals came from these agents. So these agents lead to 80% of my business. I didn't stop there of, okay, so I just need to focus on these agents. It's no, no, no. How did I get to them? And my two things are one to many presentations. So like in-person presentations or making videos. And so it's like, okay, Sean, go do presentations with real estate agents, go make videos. Don't worry about how many views or follows you get and everything will be fine. Just keep doing what you're good at. If you're good at cold calling, um, go cold call. Like that's what your given talent is. Go do what you're good at. And that's what makes this become fun. I hate cold calling. There's, there's a zero chance of me cold calling 40 realtors every Monday because the program I'm in says I have to. I'm just misaligned with that concept. So I'm not going to do it. Um, it doesn't mean I can't do business generating activities. I just have to do ones that align with what I'm good at and what I enjoy doing. And then this job becomes very, very fun, very fast. Okay. So that's one. How, how important is the quality of that borrower consultation and the quality of your advice, you know, that's powered by more. Oh. oh, that's, that's, that's a non-negotiable. So, and I, that's another thing you should make your process non-negotiable. And if a client, well, if a lead, I won't call them a client. If a lead doesn't want to work within your process, you need to have the freedom to let them go elsewhere or at least say, I don't know if I'm the right person for you. You know, fun, like how freeing it is to say, say that to somebody. So my process is what it is, and it involves, I already, like I said earlier, for the new process moving forward, uh, I use, you, we have to do a consultation. We're going to review your buyer's guide, your mortgage coach together, uh, at least over Zoom once in the very beginning, because that sets the stage for everything else. I can show you what's going on with mortgage rates. I can show you the market. I'm going to now show you net sheets um, because I need you to understand the psychology of the, of the seller. Um, we have to do these things or else I can't go into your offer with confidence knowing that you're going to win. Um, I've told buyers, you know, they're making, Oh, offer, offer, offer. They're making offers at random and I'm not involved in that process. And I've, I've said, look, you guys, I don't know if I'm the right person for you because if you're making just these, you know, shotgun offers and I'm not involved, um, if we lose, I didn't eliminate all my variables. I didn't get to go through my steps to what I feel is ridiculously important to helping you get the house you want. And I've never seen somebody make an offer on a home they didn't want. So why would we not want them to get accepted first try? So I have, they have to go through my process. That's a non-negotiable for me. And if they don't want to, um, I'm not the right, I'm not the right guy for you. You know, if you, if you want to have like a, a, a 30,000 foot lender, go to Quicken, they'll take care of that. I need to be in the weeds to make sure you win. Um, do you want me to like detail out the process? I mean, actually, not, let me say not this. Yet. Not, not yet, because okay. I want to go by level. And I do want to net this out, guys, because I've interviewed Sean a number of times. Him and I have had meals together with our families. I've done a lot of walk and talks with him. And, and guys, if there were three things, you know, three things that he does he already said one, one to many presentations. Although if he didn't do the other two things, he would not one have the confidence and two, those one to many in those videos wouldn't be great. Uh, he has an incredible borrower consultation and, and he consistently solves problems, listens to people, understands their story, understands their problems. And then he is a solutionist. I think he's, I think you've used that word before. He uses mortgage coach to deliver that solution. Uh, but he, he he does it like truly one of the absolute best in America. And because he does that, he's got ammunition and he's got confidence that when he does those videos, you know, they're they're always either just cool dude who's doing life in business. And I'll share some of my takeaways in terms of what I think Sean's magic is. So those are like two parts of the pillar. And then number three, guys, he's super strategic. Like this is a very intentional human being that, you know, when he tells his story around who his customers are, I love first responders. I love military. He, he, he always, you know, one will attack the obstacle and overcome fear once he's clear on what he wants, but when he's clear on what he wants and he's strategic and he's got a business plan, like there's no stopping this guy. So he's got a strategic plan. 
he's got an absolute, you know, huge consultation value with the consumer. And three, he's doing one to many content in, in lots of modern ways. So do you want to correct me on that or you want to add a fourth or can we say that those are the three? And then we'll, and then we're going to do the same exercise on life so that what is the Sean Herrero, you know, three paradigm yeah. life, but anything you want to add to the business side? The work side? Well, no, I think you, well, you touched on something that I wouldn't have thought of, but the you, identifying your people, right? Um, if you come from a scarcity mindset, if somebody asks you who, what type of loans you do, I do everything. I can do anything. I, I have doctor loans. I have 203K. I have this. I have that. I do reverse. You can't be all things to all people. And if you come from a place like an abundance mindset, if the only business I ever got, if I decided the only marketing I am going to do is to veterans and first responders, do you think I couldn't close 20 loans per month? There are so many people in just those two fields that we all can help. And so you have to find who your people are. I'm not saying I won't help anyone who wants my help. Of course I will. But I can't advertise all things. All I don't do 203K. I refer those out because I think you have to be a professional at that. You have to know it inside and out. You have to do a lot of something to be good at something. So I don't, I don't do 203K. I refer those to a colleague. Um, People think that's crazy. It's like, no, it's not because I can focus on what I'm actually good at. So I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that. You have to find your people. Um, yeah. So, but, so let's, let's, and by the way, guys, we've got, we're moving into the fourth quarter. I think in the next five to 10 minutes, we'll unpack life. And then if you guys ask questions, we'll answer them. And then we'll maybe unpack some of these other things. So the life piece, what are the, what are the, the pillars, the core concepts that give you both kick-ass business and have fun and be an adventure lender. You know, that's I like how you put you always get me thinking because I don't have I don't know what the pillars are, but I can tell you why I keep this is like constant. I know, work I know what they are, but I'm gonna I, I'm you gonna do? That. well I have an, I have some opinions observing yeah. you because I you know I've known you before you were a full time loan officer and yeah. I've watched you become one of you know I mean guys he's doing over a hundred million in a very challenging market while he's also having a pretty damn good life in, in what has been a, a recession in the mortgage industry. And it hasn't been a, sh a recession for Sean Herrero. So, so, but give me, tell, tell, tell everybody what you think, you know, the key to, to that life balance is. Doing what you, doing what fulfills you. Um, I don't think success is defined by money. Um, if you make millions of dollars a year, and you don't enjoy your life and you're stressed out every day, what's the point? So for me, like, I, I'm a better person to my family when I go and if I go climbing, indoors or outdoors, just taking those two-ish hours to go do that, I will be a better husband and father for the rest of the day. Um, it's like a reset for me. And the same with getting in the ocean. Like yesterday when I went and played in the surf and took photos, it was in the water for an hour. There wasn't good surf. But I was in the water for an hour and I just feel whole again. And so if those things make me feel good, why would I deprior why do I continue to deprioritize that? Right. And that's where the work comes in of Sean, these things make you happy. You should go do these things more. And then it's, oh, but you have to work, you have to work, you have to work, you have to work. No, 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 no. The work will be there. I'm gonna go do these things, and then I'll be I'll be better at work as a result of it. Um, and I have this, so I came up with this kind of, I call it my pyramid scheme. So I, I can't draw it right now, but think of a pyramid, right? And this is more, per, this is personal. This isn't business at all. But what I found, I have a 21 year old son. Um, and I found that when couples, when they become empty nesters, a lot of times that's where divorce comes from. And I think they stopped being husband and wife or a couple and they became, um, parents, just parents, kids move out. And it's like, we don't know each other anymore we're just roommates um i've seen it all too much and so what my wife and i do is i go you have to be selfish first you have to make yourself the top of the pyramid you'll spend the least amount of time but you have to prioritize yourself and do the things that make you happy and then the next little box down is me and my wife so i have to be happy to make someone else happy so we're going to spend time together as a couple and then the biggest chunk of that pyramid is our family if I don't do it in that order, then resentment gets built. Oh, I 
I want to go climbing, but I don't have time because I have to go to my kid's soccer game or I have to this or I have to that. And then resentment builds. And so I really focus on for both of us, like go do what makes you happy and fulfills you. I'm going to do the same. Then we're going to hang out as a couple. And then our family time is going to be epic. And, and what I've started to do is like leave this in the car as often as I can to be present with my family. Cool. Anything else you want to add before I go? No, fire away. So this, this is my observation guys. And I've known Sean for a lot of years. I've watched him operate. I've watched him build his brand. And, and, and I really believe part of this code exists with everybody that is living their best life and a, a really high performing business professional and a really high performing um, family you know, leader. And and so first of all, he puts himself first. In his case, putting himself first means that he's outside and he's taking adventures to the point where he bought a van and works out of a van. And, you know, one day he's working at a, you know, Santa Cruz, checking out the waves. One day he's on top of a mountain somewhere. Like he goes to extremes to, to, to get in his adventure. And and I would I would push a lot of folks. Um, it was last year where my word of the year was adventure. And Sean, I I don't know if I've ever told you you were a huge inspiration for that. I go I want to put more adventure in my life. And instead of you know I've, I I do a morning walk a lot, but before just doing the morning walk in my own neighborhood, I said you know what this year I'm going to see what a ten minute drive looks like, and I'm going to you know drive 10 minutes to do my walk. And I found an adventure walk that feeds my soul. Um, so so that's one thing, everybody on this call, I don't care where you're at, if you want to kick ass in business and be happy, you got to figure out what makes you happy. And, and you probably need to mix it up for the people that voted very stressed out and extraordinary stressed out. My guess is you're not, Again, for me, it's outside too. Uh, I don't need to be outside as much as Sean does to be happy. Or, you know, I would have a van too. Although I'm, sometimes I'm going, dude, that seems amazing. But figure out, and I, that's my push to anyone watching this. What are like the things that make you happy? And then what can you blend into your current life? And then the other thing I've known Sean for a long time, he puts himself first. And I, I know he probably doesn't want to say this to Nicole's wife. He puts his family second, but he is all in for his kids, his wife. And the note I made to myself is he makes his family happy. You know, like he is working. And even though he misses that mark, probably sometimes because he's working so many hours. But I mean, the dude yeah. is committed to making his, his wife and kids happy. And then to me, the number three is, because he's got a bitchin' business strategy that he executes, it makes everything else work. So like number three on the life side, it is business. Because if you are financially stressed, if you are not hitting your business goals, if you are working with people that you don't like to work with, uh, that whole life side doesn't work. You know, So you've got to have like pillar number three on life balance is how you've designed your business strategy. Is that accurate? Dude, you just create that. That is why it has to be a blend, and not balance, because you're absolutely right. Without a proper business plan that makes you money, you can't do the other things. You can't go take care of yourself. You can't take care of your family. You can't go on vacations in Hawaii. Um, you just, yeah, hundred percent work. Work has to be part of your personal in, in oh. our industry, in our industry. So guys, we are we are running into the last 10 minutes. I would love if anybody has questions for Sean, put them in. Also, if you want to really have a transformational experience, I just cannot, actually, I'm gonna share this. This is Sean's um, website for his event. And if you go to it, we put a link in chat already. Well, wow, man, I'm having a problem sharing it with the music on. Here we go. So if you go to it, it will just start playing. Sometimes it's just how it goes. It's just a part of my life. I'm going to let this play for a second, everybody. It's a glass high and make a toast. It's 
gonna be alright Do everything I can do today to make tomorrow alright Sometimes that's just how we go It's just a part of my life When things get low, me rule up Cause it helped me to clear my mind Me need a plan to turn things wrong I forget my life back in line so guys check this out you know you could register here you could book a room the next event is august 23rd saturday the 23rd he's got the full agenda here like if you want to go and be part of that spot, that tiny event check it out anything you want to add to that before we close out with some closing thoughts uh, I just wish that video makes me happy. That event like is fills my soul on the work side because I do want to give back to our community. Um, but it's it, it I didn't, didn't know it would be such a life changing event. I knew it would change people's business. Every single person that's come has kind of immediately closed more loans and made more money. Um, but I didn't know I'd get the life side. Like I didn't expect people to cry at this event. So um, yeah, seen that I haven't seen that video in a minute. Yeah, um, cool. And, and by the way, that's another thing. Again. Everyone listening to this, you want to crush it in life. You want to crush it in business. You want to do more loans and have fun. You gotta, you gotta do things like this. You gotta add new things to the mix. So we got well, in. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So, so on the because it showed so day one's marketing, day two's execution, and there's a word that I've been hung up on or kind of I heard on a podcast from the word remarkable. Right. This guy was uh, they were going back and forth. This guy was in a hotel and he couldn't remember the name of the hotel he was staying at. He was saying how great it was. And the guy's like, it's so remarkable you don't remember the name. And that word hit me because if you think about, I break down words all the time. Remarkable is re remark and able, being able to remark, right? To speak about. Is your process remarkable? Like your, your loan process needs to become an experience that people will talk about to other people. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest referral sources I have is my not process, but the experience that my process has become. Is your experience remarkable? Or I'm sorry, is your process, your loan process remarkable? And if it's not, you need to make it remarkable. Um, and then you, like that will create flow. So just, I, I had to, I had to touch on that because we got to have this be fun, right? Our well, clients should have fun. Well, one, one more nugget I'd like to get, like in his agenda, he's got, the psychology of an open house. And I and I truly believe for, for realtors, like, you know, if they're struggling, they need to be doing open houses. That's still a great strategy. I know when I talked to you a couple of days ago, you were talking about how you just put a bunch of open house experiences together for realtors. So let's close out with just give us some highlights. Obviously, you, you make this an agenda item and you go to it in detail mm -hmm. at your, your two-day workshop. Give us the high level of, you know, why do you, why are open houses a big part of your strategy and what do you do? Yeah. Um, so Simon Sinek says, there's a thing I saw years and years ago. He said, uh, give us an example. He says, make it about them, not about you. And all too often, the way we market is we make it about us. We're number one, we're this, we're that. Um, what I do is everything to me comes to the psychology and the emotion that people are feeling. So Open houses, the way I look at that is if somebody has 48 hours off of work and they're taking, let's just say, eight or four hours of the weekend to go do that, that's like 10% of their weekend is going to be spent open houses. Those are people that actually want to buy homes and I want to be in front of them. And with the lack of inventory that there is, let's just say 100 people come through a house, one of those 100 will buy that house, 99 of them are going to go buy something else. So it's such a great place to get real buyers that want to act right now. And so I think of the psychology that they go into. So if I walk in, and actually this came from my own personal experience. Um, I had to fight 20 offers to win my house in 2021. And, I, and the house is at, like, it's perfect. I love it. But I was upstairs and I was counting the rooms and I was like, man, I wonder how many people, I literally remember thinking this thought, I can see it in my head. I wonder how many people I'm going to have to fight to win this house. And I wonder what I'll have to offer. If that's what people are thinking, going to the open house, our marketing materials should speak to what they're thinking, not what they say. And so I call them open house engagement kits. And a large part of it is mortgage coach. Um, and I have my agents, I give them a playbook of how to use these. 
Um, but I go, I call it an open house engagement kit because I want the buyers to look at these materials, have questions and curiosity and get them to go talk to the agent. Right. And then the agent can say, what's your phone number? I'll, I'll send you a link to this uh, buyer's guide right now, the mortgage coach link. And then they have their contact info. It's, it's like one of the best referral tools you can get. So the reason I love open houses so much is realtors have to be there. Number one, it gives me the opportunity to add more value to a realtor than anyone else. Number two, and I'm more, more and most importantly, helping buyers overcome the fear and psychology of competing in this market. And I love that part because I can create freedom within their emotions to look at price different. I always say, you know, don't look at what the house costs. What does the house cost to you, right? You're not paying cash. So who cares what the price tag is? What does it cost you monthly payment? What does it cost you in cash out of pocket? If we show them those things, we give them freedom to make better decisions. What, how do you use mortgage coach to help support your open houses? Like what, what is, mm -hmm. what do you do and how yeah. does it value? So it depends on the open house. So again, like, like if it's a first week in open house, looks like I look at the photos of the home. Is it going to be busy? Here's the list price. Here's 25,000 over. So columns in mortgage coach. I'm assuming everyone's familiar with this. If you're not, I have a video on this somewhere in the, in the 10 X library. Um, but I'll show the list price and then I'll show 25,000 over list and then 50,000 over list. And depending on the down payment, your cash to close increases, right? So if you did uh 20% down, your cash to close would increase by 5,000. If you increase your price by 25,000 with current interest rates, your monthly payment goes up $157 a month. So is a house worth losing over $25,000 in price? Emotionally, yeah, that's crazy. Why would anybody pay that? Is it worth losing over $157 a month? No. Is it worth losing over $5,000? No. Um, I, it's the same question, but shifted into a way that they're looking at what does the house cost me? So I print the mortgage coach presentation specific to that property. And I have the agent put it in like these like stands. Um, I don't print a bunch of them because I don't want them to take them. Um, I want them to have to ask for the information. So they look at the graphs and charts and they ask questions and they go, well, I want one of these. Cool. What's, what's your phone number or your email? I'll send you the link to it right now. And then when they get the link, I record a video that explains exactly what I just said. Here's the right way to look at price. I'm able to be at 20 open houses a weekend without being at the open house, right? Like we have broker tour today and I'm hosting a broker tour that I'm not going to be at, but it, but my marketing materials, my mortgage coach pieces will be there and the link, the agent will be able to give the link to other agents that come through. So I get to be seen by many, a one to many without being. Guys, this is a game changer. Remember, this is a guy who's doing $100 million a year in this business. And he just shared with you how he is doing 20 open houses, helping 20 agents. He's not there. And he's helping them get leads. He's helping them be more unique. He's helping them be more valuable. Again, you want to have a great work-life blend or work-life flow? Uh, it's it's all of these things. So first of all, I hope everybody got a lot of value. For those of you that really resonate with Sean and you want to go deep, I hope to see some of you at his workshop. Um, it is really special. You only, you limit it to, is it 10 or 12 people that you limit it to? 10. 10. So he limits Just it. Just 10 people, yeah. And it's in cool Newport Beach. Check it out. Link down below. If you're watching this in the YouTube, link down below. You got a minute left. Any closing thoughts for everybody? I just the, the open house because you just said it. So if we bring this full circle back to the NAR settlement, buyers are going to want to pay agents that give them value, right? They realize they're not free. Um, with the open house engagement kit and using Mortgage Coach, I am making my agents more valuable so that buyers see more value with them and are more willing to sign their buyer broker agreement than anyone else's. Will you, will you forward one of your open house um, experiences so that in this call, we can have a link down below. We'll have a link to the quiz. I'll have a link to that full masterclass where Sean showed you guys exactly how he's doing a, a mortgage coach analysis and he's showing different options. I'll have a link to the 10X page. Guys, we've given you all the training. Uh, hopefully you got a lot of value from this. Uh, let Sean know in reactions. Give them a reaction, what you thought of today's call. Let's see if we get a lot of a uh, standing ovation, lots of hearts, a uh, couple standing ovations, a couple little party signs. All right, man. Well, hope everybody got value. This is a wrap. If you don't already. Thank you, brother.
follow the Mortgage Coach YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe so you get updates. Make sure you go to savageinsights.com. If you're not already in my mobile club, Savage Insights, at least once or twice a week, I'm texting the best content that I create. So get in that Savage Insights mobile club. And at savageinsights.com, there's a link to sign up for Scriptopalooza and all the most important thing we do. Take care, everybody. This is a wrap.